Welcome to Genuine Humans, exploring the stories behind the great marketing leaders of our time and hearing how their journeys have influenced the brands they've built. Brought to you by The Social Element, here are our hosts, Tamara Littleton, CEO and founder, and Wendy Christie, Chief People Officer. Welcome back to Genuine Humans, and I'm delighted to be joined by my co-host, Wendy Christie. Wendy, how are you doing? Hello, Tamara. You know, a little bit stressed out, a bit of a tech problem a minute ago. So it all seems to be fine now, and I'm looking forward to a lovely chat. It doesn't seem right that we're we're going to be joined by someone who's been in the uh, healthcare industry and marketing for for years. And I've actually got a bit of a cold and a cough, but I'm going to power through. (laughs) But that is a nice segue because I would just like to introduce our new guest, who is uh, Jason Andre, who is the CMO of uh, New Fabrics. And Jason, we are delighted to have you join us today. Hello. Nice to see both of you. Glad to be here. Jason, do you want to... First of all, explain New Fabrics, what you're doing, and also then if you could then go a bit backwards to sort of explain how you got to be where you are now. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, And it's a good opportunity because New Fabrics, unfortunately, yet is not a household name. So I love the opportunity to explain it. Um, And like you had said, I'm the chief marketing officer here, which is an absolute dream. So... I'm pleased to work here because what New Fabrics is, is that we are a revolutionary new drug delivery system. You might think, what is that? Um, I've been in healthcare my whole life, but this brand is actually very unique because we have uh, the ability through a patent to put medicine into garments. Mm. And so we're able to put medicine into yarn and then through the creation of garments, we create things that people can wear out of that. And then they're able to transdermally accept their medicine through their skin. I've worked in transdermal medicine wow. before, so it's a natural fit, but that's what we do today. Um, and like I said, we're the only ones that can do it. Uh, and we have a platform, right, where we can put any medicine, uh, supplement, or vitamin into yarn. But what some people who use us would know us most for is our pain line. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a line of pain compression garments that we sell nationally here in the U.S., And so if your knee is sore versus taking a a pill, you can slip on our garment and you're able to uh, treat your pain directly at the source. Similar to a cream, but without the smell or the mess, you can just what you put it on, you can wear it all day and you can kind of forget about it. So that's a little background on new fabrics. I love it. And and how did you come, you know, why new fabrics? Because I want to hear about your your background, but I know that you know, this is quite a, a change in direction for you. So can yeah. you perhaps share with the listeners your your history? Yeah. So I have had the ability of working on many uh, launches uh, around the globe for pharmaceuticals and specifically RX to OTC switches. And I did that with an amazing company uh, called KlaxoSmithKline, now known as Halion. And when it was time for me to look for my next journey, I wanted to make sure that I was still able to kind of deliver on what I had loved doing. And that was kind of making people's lives better uh, through health and wellness. And so when I was exploring the current marketplace at that time, I really wasn't prepared to leave unless I found a brand that I truly loved. Mm. And when I came across New Fabrics, it really hit on a few things for me. But really, it was something that was still in the health and wellness space. But it was also going to give me that next exciting chapter in my career where it was kind of new. And like I'd said, I've always worked on launches. And what I loved is kind of building something out of nothing. And I'm, I'm hope I'm, I hope I'm able to do that here. Fantastic. Now, I, I also know, because when we've chatted before, that you haven't always been in America as well. Yeah. So tell, <laughs> tell us where you've been to. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and I, can, I, can tell, I can start you further back in my journey, because I've kind of moved over a lot or moved around a lot. So where, where to start? Uh, I've always wanted to be in healthcare, right? And but that wasn't always the case. <laughs> so I actually graduated from Northern Illinois University in 2008. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting about that time and that location is two things. One, uh, unfortunately, in 2008, Northern Illinois University suffered from a mass shooting um, that took place on campus oh my, my senior year. And then also 2008. 
was the housing market crash <laughs> in the US. And so the reason I bring that up is because here I was graduating from university, ready to start my career. And unfortunately, it wasn't the best time. So the first was uh, the shooting incident that actually, for many reasons, was was a terrible situation, but it also delayed my ability to get mm. a job. So as you can imagine, when something like that happens, there's a period of time where school is no longer in session. It is very difficult to kind of get the curriculum up and running again. Uh, it actually put my whole class back. And it was actually something I lost my first job over because it was one of those situations where you had secured the job before graduating, but then when the when the date changed, therefore that company, unfortunately, and I understand that, I wasn't able to move forward with it. And that happened to many, many folks. And that actually pushed me into finance, <laughs> which is interesting. And specifically finance, it was uh, mortgages. And so I started my career, I, I got a job with a company that I loved, and I was actually um, selling and refinancing mortgages right out of school. Soon after that, within less than a year, the company I was working for, as many were at that period of time, it went bankrupt. And I tend to make good situations out of bad. So I actually took five months off and said, let's, let's reset this again. <laughs> I felt like I had such an ambitious goal of coming out of school. And I said, let's, let's take some time and figure out what's next. Uh, I'm a big planner. And I really kind of sat down and wrote out my career and what I wanted. Uh, I did hone in on marketing and I did hone in specifically on healthcare, which a lot of people thought was too niche for me. But I thought if I'm going to sell something, I might as well sell something that's going to improve people's lives, then potentially make them worse. And I was able to tell that story to as many people as I could. And the one person that listened, his name was Les Ziegler. I met him in Midway Airport and he was willing to take a chance on me, which was really funny because I was not interviewing for the job. And he's like, hey, I actually don't work for a healthcare company, but I work for a company that is a vendor for a healthcare company. Would you be interested? Uh, and at that time I was. And so, and it fit into my career path, right? Because I really fell into the lattice approach and I wanted to do sales. I wanted to do marketing. I wanted to do innovation. I kind of wanted to do the full 360. Uh, and that was my stepping stone into it. So that was not when I worked for Klein. I actually started as a vendor for them. So I was the carrying the bag, as they say. Uh, I would go into the different uh, retailers and talk to the pharmacists and try to get them to either put more of our product on shelf uh, or I would sell in uh, new product items. And quickly after that, he held up to his promise <laughs> and I moved into the client office and I started, that's really kind of where I started my career. Uh, and I bounced around quite a bit both location-wise, but also in my career. And something that I um, tried to live by, and I still do to this day, I don't, I don't really know where it came from, where this ambition came from, but it was wise advice from someone, I'm sure. But I never wanted to stay in a role for more than two years. Okay. And that was something that I felt for my progression rate that I wanted was important. But to be honest, it also is my ability to get bored really easily. Mm -hmm. So I, I stuck to that and uh, I held all of my uh, managers account for that too. Of course you have to perform. And so that's kind of what started me on my career. And I've done everything from associate brand manager. Uh, I've done the innovation brand manager. I've been a retail sales rep. And then I got into product launches, which, which is where I kind of fell uh, in love with marketing. And I've done that for many brands. I've launched Flonase here in the U S which was, which was a big one. And what's also important is each job took me to a new location so I started in Chicago, I moved to Pittsburgh, I then moved to New York in the New Jersey area, and then I moved to Switzerland. So my recent job before my current job was I was leading the global digital content team for uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, and I did that for about four and a half years uh, right outside of Geneva. And honestly, it, it was everything I had wanted, but it, it had been 15 years, believe it or not, and it was time for my next <laughs> move. And it was it was time to also come back to the US. And so that kind of brings me to current day. Wow. And I think that there is something that, you know, I would it would be remiss of me not to to pick up on it again. But that start of your career, mm. that obviously it didn't pan out the way you want because of things out of your control. Do you think that built up a sort of a certain resilience of and, and also maybe more just going with the flow of, of let's see what happens? Because that's you know, it, it didn't pan out the way you wanted. 
Yeah, I think it did. I mean, only until reflecting recently could I, you know, articulate it that way. I think you're correct. I also think with young ambition and drive, I wasn't willing to let anything get in my way. Yeah. And that was more of my personality. However, it sounds easier said than done because it was not easy. I'll be honest, that time was, you know, I didn't have a job, but I was willing to wait. But then sometimes the, you know, fear would sneak in, you know, are you not going to get a job? And I think just reminding yourself that you aren't wrong in what you're looking for mm -hmm. helps you stay on the right path, if that makes sense. So that's kind of what's always reminding me. And I will also say I've had many unfortunate situations happen to myself, but I've always said, how do I make this into a good situation? Yeah. You know, don't let it define you. Let it, let it help you go on to the next that's such a great attitude. I love it. It really is. And, and and is that something you've always had, Jason? I mean, what were you like as a as a child? Did you have that ambition and drive and ability to make situations good? I I guess I would I would say that I've heard that from people around me. I've never felt that. Mm -hmm. So you know how I grew up is actually quite unique. I never have thought it was unique. I actually didn't tell many people for for actually I guess fear of embarrassment, but now I have, and people find it as one of the most interesting things about me, although I, I don't find it that interesting. Um, but I grew up on a farm uh, showing steers. <laughs> so I traveled kind of the U.S. showing steers with my family probably until my late teens. That's what helped me want to know. That's what helped me my journey because it was somewhere I didn't want to be, if that makes sense. I think later on in life, I looked back and realized. Right. <laughs> I realized it is where my work ethic comes from. It is where, you know, my ability to make good or bad situations good. But I'll be honest, it's also what put me on the springboard to start moving around because it wasn't a natural fit for me, if that makes sense. <laughs> it certainly does. And did you have uh, did you have any specific ideas then about something you did want to do? Or was it more about, OK, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I definitely knew what I didn't want to do. We also, gosh, growing up, I wouldn't say we were remote because it wasn't a very small town, but I, I always fell in love. It was, it was in interesting, was TV. And it was kind of my ambitious for, ambition for marketing. I think TV commercials were something that I was always fascinated by. When I found out that people made them, I thought that that was really interesting. And that's kind of what set me in the pursuit of marketing, to be honest. But it's what actually then helped me get out of where I was. So, you know, up until before I went to high school, I was in a class of eight. I went to a very small class, a yeah. uh, very small school. Uh, and then I went to high school and then I went to an even bigger university, which I just I kind of fell in love with school. I love the organization. I love the grading. I loved the, you know, uncovering new things. And then even after university, I went to get my MBA that I continued. I've always continued my education, but I think it's because I, I, I think it was because I was always looking for something different outside of what I had originally mm -hmm. started on. But as I've gotten older, I do appreciate the, the, <laughs> the way I grew up, but it, it, it definitely was something I strived to, to do more. It's certainly a great talking point. I don't think that's a story we've heard so far in, in all of the, the podcasts we've done. And were there people who you particularly looked up to? And, and not just as a child, actually, but it, people who've since then who've influenced you or supported you in your career? I think I think it's always been people when there's a bad situation or you're working with less less genuine people that have helped you get out of that for me. Right. You know, starting even at a younger age, it's interesting going into, you know, love of TV and things like that. This She wouldn't have thought I would mention her, but I would say my high school English teacher, uh, her name, her name was Mrs. Davis, but she kind of was the first person that helped me see that, you know, your words matter, your words can move people. It's actually mm -hmm. where I started to create things and started even poetry writing, which I kind of roll my eye out because I'm not a poet, but I started to do those things. And she really encouraged me to pursue that. She thought I was going to be a, <laughs> a songwriter, but that obviously didn't happen. And then I still even... could. <laughs> Maybe. No, it's not too late. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was kind of like the earliest person I, I could, I can definitely remember. I mean, I mentioned, you know, having 
that ability to look for a new job. And, you know, I came across that guy at the airport, his, his name was Les, and we've maintained friendships throughout my career. And he was someone that helped me realize that what I was looking for wasn't crazy and really helped me. And there's been several others. I mean, I've moved around enough and had a, many amazing jobs on a many amazing brands. And therefore I've worked with many amazing people. And uh, I, I think also what's important is you keep in contact with them. Yeah. Yeah, I think our network is just so important, isn't it? And it's it's funny how I, I still have sometimes people getting in touch with me that I worked with 20 years ago or something like that. And it's just, it's great when you can, can have that network. Just thinking, uh, Jason, back to the, the fact that you've moved over to, I'm, I'm not going to call it a startup, but it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a different beast to what you've been used to with say GSK, for example. But uh, what are you... What are you learning and, and how different are they? So it's it's definitely a startup for sure. Um, I, I think we've had a lot of success because we're in over 20,000 retailer doors, but we still are a very small brand that's up and coming. I think what's, I, I guess what always surprises me on a daily basis is that it's not that unique and, and in a good way. I think the problems aren't unique. I think mm. the problems are the same problems. We have in large global matrix organizations. I think what's special, and this should be no surprise, is I think how people tackle them and the ability to do it much faster always surprises me. So every time a problem comes, I'm like, this is very familiar. This, this is very known. This is normal. Uh, but I think the solutions and the way we come to fix them is what is amazing to see um, and the speed in which you can do that. But it's it's interesting too, like the people that I would say we work with because New Fabrics has around 40 employees, they're equally all amazing and they come from all these amazing backgrounds and and I just love that. Mm -hmm. So so I, I feel very at home if that makes sense, but I'm constantly reminded that it's a much smaller organization. But I was definitely ready for this after 15 years of doing what I was doing for, for an amazing company. I was looking for that, you know, diamond in the rough and I, and I think I found out. And when you talk about the industry, you sound so passionate. Is is that something that you you feel is important for marketers that you have to be passionate about the brand? I, I do. I think I think marketing and brand is is all about tone of voice, and I think the people on the team need to emulate that and share that. So therefore, you must be passionate about it. That's not to say I I haven't. I I, I think I guess that's what I was going to say is that's not to say that. Everyone has to be equally as passionate, if that makes sense. I think you definitely need a team of individuals that have different skill sets. But now when it comes to marketing, I do think you need to be that you know, brand poet that we talked about, you know, or you need to have that consumer insight that you share with who you're selling to so that it is more than just selling a product. I think that's something that most people forget specifically when it comes to healthcare, you know, pain or health is personal. Mm. And I think consumers want to be talked to in a very personal way, specifically in today's world. And so I think if you're not passionate, it could easily slip into just product benefits, mm. you know, pro problem solution. Uh, you know, I think all of the things that maybe today consumers are bored of, um, I think you need to have that edge. And I think that edge is passion. And what's exciting you in the sort of marketing industry at the moment then? I think, gosh, I, um, most pe I'm trying to think of what most people would say. I think a lot of people would say, you know, all of the automation is happening is so exciting. But I, I think what I would say is the engagement that consumers are willing to have with brands is what's exciting. I think engagement has always been there and it's always been talked about. It's always been equally as important. But I think now what you're seeing is that consumers not only are expecting it, I think the younger generations, you know, are demanding it. And if you don't have that positive engagement and transparent engagement with consumers, you're not going to win. And I think that just really excites me because it's kind of going back to how marketing was, you know, before yeah. the disruption, of even TV and technology, that's really what it, what it was, you know, think about door to door sales <laughs> uh, of products. I think now, consumers are kind of expecting that same level of engagement, which, which for me is really exciting. And it's, um, it feels like it's new and endless possibilities, I guess, is what I would say. And kind of going back to what your teacher was saying about the importance of words and words matter. Right. And, and I think 
making sure that if it was you on the other side of that, whether it's TV or email or, or, or what have you, you know, you would accept what someone is saying to you. And I think that's just really important because um, consumers can read through the lines, if that makes sense. So I always tell my team it's, it's better to be um, honest than it is to be regretful. Yeah, and kind of cool to be working with such groundbreaking products and technology and, and being able to sort of drive what is that tone of voice going to be. That's That feels really exciting. Yeah, I, I definitely think, I think you're right, because is is pain a new category? No, but how people seek treatment really is. And I think there's so much going on. And hmm. I think to have the ability to work on a brand that actually is offering something new is really exciting. And I love talking to consumers because they're always like, oh, I didn't know that existed. Tell me more. And I think that's when you know you have a good product. Yeah. So what are you most proud of, uh, either in or out work, you know, something more in your personal life or something at work? What, what's what's made you proud? Well, so I am a father of two. And I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I'm very proud of my... So two girls, they're born on the same day, which uh, oh. people think... <laughs> <laughs> they're always like, what are the odds of that? I'm like, well, it's 101 and 365. <laughs> so not twins. So the same, the same date, but different years. That's right. So they're three years apart. I'm very proud of them. Wow. I think they've been on this journey with us specific, specifically, even as we've moved around the world. And I think their resilience I'm very proud of, and I'm hoping it sets them up for amazing future, but also with, you know, amazing skill sets. And so I just say that because I have recently moved, actually twice within the last year, I've just been really proud to watch them uh, be able to manage those transitions. I love that answer. And do you think the amount of change that you've been through has, has helped you support them with them? I, I hope so. I think, I think it's always something in the back of my mind and now something that I value and so the past couple of years for us has been a lot of transition. Part of the reason we moved from Switzerland back to the U.S., which then, you know, kicked kickstart a career change. I actually lost both of my parents in a very short amount of time. And that was something I was so not. Sorry. Thank you. was not something I was probably equipped or re- definitely ready to to handle. But. Unfortunately, the situation wasn't going to change. And I kind of relied back on what I've always done is like, how do I make this absolutely terrible situation into a positive one? It it allows you to focus. So I did that, which is why then I changed careers. It's why then we wanted to come back to the, the United States. And I really realized the importance of that skill set at that time, because I don't know if I could have managed it without it. Um, And so to your question, yeah, uh, I do value it a lot. And it's something that I do probably on a daily basis, (laughs) try to overly teach my children, you know, if something's not going your way, that's okay. You know, how do you not fix it? How do you make it better? Uh, Or how do you deal with it better? Or how do you turn it into something positive is something I'm constantly, I do need to remind myself, but it's something I remind my children. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like you might need to do a TED talk actually, Jason. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, it's, I, gosh, it's something too, like, you know, family, we're talking about family, but it's something I remind my sister and my, remind my brother. I'm like, cause you know, we're all on different stages specifically as it retains to this, but I'm like, you just got to make this negative situation a positive one. Cause if not, it's going to stay a negative situation. So I'm not saying you have to move across the world, which is something I did. I'm not saying you have to change job. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, what can you learn from it? you know, how do you improve your life from it is kind of something that I think is important. Yeah, it's something I can subscribe to. I uh, I refer to myself as and not the CEO, but the chief eternal optimist. It's it's uh, I love that. It's just how, <laughs> how you have to deal with life, really. Yeah, no, I love that. And I and I think, too, like, even as it, you know, when you look at the teams that you manage at work, it's you have to tell people, like, don't react as if this is happening to you. Mm-hmm. React to the situation, because I think when you internalize things and you assume negative intent, it's really where your brain can start to spiral. And for me, it's all about then how do you change the external environments? How do you uh, react to it differently versus reacting reacting to it internally? So 
it's it's something I'm con- I feel like comes up anytime. Like if something's not going your way, or we missed a deadline, or sales are down, it's like okay, that's great. That's the problem. Let's talk about how we fix it. Let's not talk about how negatively it's going to impact us. Wise words. So I think we're gonna shift gear a little bit now, and this is where the the part of the podcast where we uh, we sort of ask you a few more quick fire questions and a bit more personal. So I'll let Wendy Wendy kickstart. A nice gentle start. What's your idea of a perfect weekend? <laughs> oh, so I definitely used to be the extrovert wanting to go out and I'm definitely no longer that person. So my my ideal weekend, honestly, is probably the laziest one I could think of. It would be waking up and having a big breakfast, getting things done around the house, a, whole, a movie night for sure with everybody I I love. And then honestly, early to bed. The earlier I can go to bed, the better the weekend I feel. So, yeah. I hear that, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> I'm embracing that <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love that. Like on a Monday when they were like, what did you do? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> if you could time travel, this is completely different gear again. If you could time travel to any point with no consequence, future or past, when or where would you go? Uh, so I would definitely be a future person. This is about a date. It would be like 20, 2046. <laughs> Only because I'm just so obsessed with knowing how things are going to turn out. Like I would love to just do a quick check-in with myself, you know, 20, 30 years down the road. It's interesting. One, I want to know if everything worked out. But two, if it didn't, I need to prepare myself for that. So I would want to know uh, what I'm up against for the next 20 years. Yeah. I mean, the no con- consequence thing in a way kind of makes it harder because it's like it, looking ahead. If if it's not what you want to see, yeah. I can't do anything about it. At least I can prepare myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you could be remembered for just one thing, what would it be? One thing? Oh, gosh, I'm going to say two. It would be, um, I would say a good father and a good friend. I mean, relationships, I guess, if I had to say one. I really try to form really great relationships. I think they're mutually beneficial. And I don't know, I I guess a father and a friend. I think that's great. Uh, Food. I love a bit of food, particularly American food, actually. But what's your favorite food experience that you remember? This one's easy for me. I had my, so my mother visited me in Switzerland and we took her to Zermatt. I don't know if either of you have been. Um, but we had an amazing time and we were able to take that train up to the Matterhorn and we had, uh, fondue with, it was with my wife and my, uh, oldest daughter at the time. And I, we just had the best time. We, we drank more wine than we should with fondue and it was just really good food and good company. And it was a magical trip, I guess I should say, but that dinner specifically, I have lots of photos from that. I, I love fabulous. I think you are meant to drink a lot of wine with fondue. I think it's it makes them digest it or something. Oh yes, I, I was like I can't ever remember. Yeah, you're right because you're not supposed to drink water because apparently that's right. <laughs> my my, uh, my mother is half Swiss, and that's always been my excuse that I know these things. <laughs> yes, I, I yes, I always get that wrong. <laughs> that's definitely a rule I can get on board with. <laughs> How would your friends describe you? I would say, oh gosh, I would say adventure, um, adventurously loud. I, I'm a, I'm a loud person. In fact, whenever you get me in a room, people always mock my laugh <laughs> because I guess I kind of enjoy, enjoy laughing out loud, but I, adventurous, right? Like I'm kind of the one who wants to plan everything. I'm the one who wants to kind of take it probably the extra mile. Um, so yeah. Okay. And if you've got a loud voice or a loud laugh rather, do you have a loud singing voice? Cause the next one is what is your karaoke go-to song? Oh, so gosh, it takes many glasses of wine before I would actually do this. But I do love to surprise people. It is country. It would be Why Don't We Just Dance by uh, Josh Turner. And so I always struggle because I always have to make sure that that is a song that they have on the ready. But yeah, that would be my go-to. Nice. Well, we've come to the end. And Jason, I, I just want to say you have been such a, an inspirational guest. And I really... I've just really enjoyed our conversation. Before we end, I wanted to just check, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to share or any closing thoughts from you? No, no, I don't. I mean, you could, you should ask me for my phone number so we can stay in contact. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think for me, it's, 
you know, cliche, like life is a journey. I think you have to do what you love. I think you have to be willing to pivot for sure. I think you have to stay true to yourself. So I would say, you know, enjoy the ride, but also don't take yourself too seriously. I have, I've had the pleasure to say that I've loved every job that I've had along my career, but it's because that was important to me. You know, if I wasn't having fun doing it, I, I wasn't going to do it. And so for me, that's really worked out and it's, take, it's taken me to a lot of great places. Um, it's kind of got, got me to where I am today. You've been listening to Genuine Humans, brought to you by The Social Element. If you loved what you heard, remember to subscribe or you can find out more at www.thesocialelement.agency.